turn, if you would, to one of the most familiar scriptures in all the Bible. Be John 3.16. John 3.16. Probably don't need to read that. I imagine everybody in this room knows exactly what that says. If it... If you don't know it by book, chapter, and verse, you'll know it when you read it. I I guarantee you we've all heard it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a greatly comforting scripture. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But is that where it ends? Is that where it stops? If all is is all we have to do is believe in Jesus Christ if we want to get to heaven. Is that the end of it? Many people in the denominational world will say that it is. They'll say that we are saved on the merits of God's grace alone, through faith alone. I have seen this. I've seen it as I'm driving up and down the roads on various denominations, marquees, or the name of their church. Faith, whatever church. Grace, whatever. XYZ church. You see that. I get on the Internet and I... And I surf websites and I look at their, I'll, I'll see a, a, a congregation and I'll go look at them and they'll have a, have a deal on there that says what we believe. And then you'll go click on that and you'll read what they believe. And they go down through there and, and they say that uh, the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It's, it's this and that. And that's all right. That's all good. And then they get down there to this grace, this salvation thing. How do we believe that we're saved? And the overwhelming majority of them say that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Well, what does the Bible say that saves us? And without a doubt, John 3.16 says that he that believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It says that. And Paul says, by, say, by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. That would be in Ephesians 2.8, I believe. And we're going to be looking at that verse here as we get into this, into this lesson. What does the Bible say saves us? Does the Bible say, is there anything else in the Bible that says this will save us or that will save us beyond just belief? Is there? Yes, there is. I have seven pages of them right here. And we're going to go through a bunch of them tonight as this lesson and we want to keep in mind that that we don't learn all the truth through just one passage of scripture we don't and if we and if we're getting our whole truth if we're building our doctrine and our beliefs based on one scripture then then we have messed up terribly from the get go the sum of God's worth is, word is truth. The psalmist wrote that. The sum of God's word is truth. We take all of what the Bible says whenever we formulate what it is that, that God's will for us is. And there are a whole bunch of scriptures in the Bible that say that these various things save us. And we're going to look at some of those. In Isaiah 12.2, we read... Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. In the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, 3, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. God saves us. The Bible says right there, Peter says, 
in that scripture, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. That's salvation. We're saved by God. Are we saved by God alone? Does God, I mean, this verse right here, does this say that God saves us and all we, and all we have to do is just be alive? No. There's, there's requirements. There's conditions for salvation. Yes, belief saves us. God saves us. What about Jesus? We've all heard that song, Jesus Saves. 1 Timothy 1.15 This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world, into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Hebrews 5.9 reads, And being made perfect, He, speaking of Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Jesus saves. No doubt about it. But does He save us in and of just Him? Is there anything else? Are, are, is anybody going to be so foolish as to say, yeah, it says right here that Jesus saves us. That's it. We don't have to do anything else. Well, they'll tell you that belief alone will save. So why, why, why couldn't somebody say, well, Jesus saves us. We don't have to do anything. Why couldn't you say that? Because it's not true. Because there are many things in the Bible that saves us, and they all work together. The Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit saves us. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The Holy Spirit saves us. Grace saves us. And we all know that. Grace saves us. Acts 15.11, but we believe that through the grace of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.8, which is one that I'd already partially quoted, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Yes, we are saved by grace. Are we saved by grace alone? Or are we saved by everything in the Bible that says that saves us? A consideration of that. We are not saved by grace alone. We're not. If we were saved by grace alone, we couldn't fall from it. Galatians 5, 3 through 4, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Speaking of the law of Moses here. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Paul was speaking of, was drawing a contrast between the Mosaic law, the Levitical law, and the gospel. The, the, the law which we might call the law of Christ. If we were saved by grace alone, you couldn't fail. You wouldn't have to do anything if we were saved by grace. Yet the Hebrew writer says, Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many, and therefore, and thereby, excuse me, many be defiled. Looking diligently lest anybody fail of the grace of God. If we were saved by God's grace alone, it would be impossible to fail it. You wouldn't have to be diligent. You wouldn't have to do anything. All that would be required for salvation, if it were by grace alone, would be your heartbeat. That's it. So we know, we know that we're not saved by grace alone, yet the denominational world will tell you that we are. What else does the Bible say saves us? Love saves us. John 3.16. We, uh, we quoted that one at the very beginning, our, our opening text for this lesson. For God so loved the world that He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're saved by love. We're saved by the love of God. Mercy saves us. As we read in Titus 3, 5, Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. We're saved by God's mercy. 
The cross saves us. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our, Lord, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I, un, and I unto the world. The cross. Save in the cross. Jesus' blood saves us in 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as He in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Romans 5, 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Ephesians 1, 9. Seven, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. We're saved by Jesus' blood. The name of Christ saves us. Acts 4.10 Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the, death, from the dead, even by Him doth this man stand here before you whole. The name of Jesus Christ. Is anybody going to be so blind as to say that the name of Jesus Christ alone is going to save anybody? Of course not. There are conditions. There are things that have to be done. There are things that have to be fulfilled and met in order for us to be saved. The Word of God saves us. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And James 1.21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The word of God saves us. Preaching saves us. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Mark 16, 15-16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. There is a response required when we hear the gospel preached. Preaching alone does not save us any more than the Word of God saves us alone or Jesus saves us alone or grace or belief or anything else alone. It all works together. Everything that the Bible says that saves us is what saves us, not any one particular thing. Baptism in water saves us. 1 Peter 3 20 through 21, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was it preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism in water saves us. Calling on the name of the Lord saves us. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Boy, now wouldn't that be easy? If that's the only thing that saved us. If that's all we had to do. And yet there are people out in the denominational world that will tell you that one certain thing is all you need to be saved. Well, if there's any one certain thing that can save us, who is to say which one that is? Who is to say what it is, that one thing that will save us? Who's, whose decision is that to make? If they say that belief saves us alone, then why can't we look at Romans 10, 13 and say, all I've got to do is call on the name of the Lord. Everything that the Bible says saves us, saves us. What about working? Does working save us? James 2, 24. You see then how that by works... A man is justified, and not by faith only. 
Acts 10, 34 through 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Philippians 2, 12. Wherefore, my beloved, or my beloved, as ye have also always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Romans 2, 7 through 10. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But the words of uh, Jesus, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Jesus says work. He says labor. For the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. And then he says, What the Son of Man shall give you. That's very important. We are told to work for something that we will be given. Very, very important. And we're going to look at that in detail in the closing of this lesson. So if you would, keep that in mind. You're going to work for something that you're going to be given. Luke 13, 24, the words of Jesus again, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and will not be able. John 5, 28 through 29, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Works, working, obedience, works of righteousness, these things save us. Do they save us by themselves? No. Not at all. What about obedience? We quoted this one earlier. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. We're saved by obedience. Endurance saves us. Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my, for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Perseverance, endurance, saves us. Patience saves us. We're saved by patience. Hebrews 6.12 That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Revelation 14.12-13 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Saved by patience. The truth, the love of the truth, saves us. Second Thessalonians 2.10 And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. We have to love the truth. It saves us. But not by itself. You can love the truth and not obey it, and you will not be saved. Fear saves. We're saved by fear. Jude 23 and others saved with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Philippians 2.12, one that we've already quoted. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear saves us. We can save ourselves. We know we can't do that in and of our own works. 
So before everybody throws Bibles at me, I'll get, let me say this all the way. We can save ourselves. Acts 2 through 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Well, how do we do that? The Bible tells us exactly how to do it. 1 Timothy 4.16. Paul, writing to Timothy, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. We can save ourselves by heeding and continuing in the doctrine of Christ. That means all of it. That means all of the New Testament, all of the Word, not verses pulled out of context, isolated from the rest. We can save ourselves. We all know that we cannot save ourselves in and of ourselves without Christ. We all understand that. But by heeding and continuing the doctrine of Christ, the Word of Truth, the Gospel, the New Testament, we can save ourselves. The way of salvation. How does the Bible say that we are to save ourselves? The steps. Hearing saves us. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Believing saves us. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The account of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 30-31 reads, And brought them out and said, Sirs, this is the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? That's what the Philippian jailer asked. What must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Romans 10, 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So belief saves us. Hearing saves us. Repentance. What about repentance? Luke 13, 3. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Well, if we don't repent, we're going to perish. 2 Corinthians 7.10 for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Confession saves us. Matthew 10:32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Romans 10, 9 through 10. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession is made unto salvation. Baptism saves us. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Baptism saves us. Faithfulness unto death saves us. Revelation 2.10 Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. No one thing in and of itself will bring salvation. All the things that Scripture teach that save us work together in unison to bring about our salvation. Leaving anything out is to leave the commandments of God unfulfilled and our salvation undone, incomplete. God played a role in our salvation. Man did not deserve it. Man cannot earn it or pay for it and can never repay it, no matter what works that he may accomplish in the name of Jesus Christ. Our hope for salvation was offered by the grace of God. Grace is defined as an undeserved, beneficial disposition towards someone. Many people in the denominational world argue that if we have to do anything at all to procure salvation, that it cannot be by grace. Nothing in the process of the Christian life lived in faithful obedience in any way militates against salvation being by grace through faith. Neither does it argue against salvation being free. 
God's gracious offers to man are always free. No matter what we have to do, man can do nothing at all to purchase, earn, merit, or in any other way obtain salvation apart from God's gracious offer. It does not, however, imply that nothing at all must be done by man to receive it. Paul never taught, he never taught that nothing at all must be done in order to receive salvation. For God to even reveal himself and his expectations is grace. For God to reveal our violations against that will is grace. For God to provide a way of atonement for sin is grace. For God informing us of that atonement is grace. For God to defer judgment to give us time to respond is grace. For God revealing to us how to respond is grace. The availability of salvation under any circumstances whatsoever must be grace. This is because God does not owe salvation to anybody. He would be perfectly entitled to send sinless man to eternal punishment. If God were to require nothing of us, not even faith, in order to receive salvation, that would be grace. If he were to require only acceptance of Jesus as the Son of God, as many people wrongly believe and teach, that would be grace. And his making salvation available through obedience to the gospel plan is also grace. If he extended salvation only to those who suffered fatal martyrdom, it would still be grace. In other words, if it's said in the Bible, He that dieth, giveth, giveth his life in my name shall be saved. If it said that, it would still be grace. Even if you died, even if you gave your life for Christ, you still have not repaid what it cost him to give us that hope. It would still be grace. Under all of these conditions, any provenance of salvation is grace because he does not owe us anything, nor is there any possible set of circumstances by which God can be placed in debt to anyone or anything that he has created. If we think of grace as a comprehensive theological term standing for everything that God does to procure our salvation, then it refers to his plan of salvation through history, the promise to the patriarchs, preparation through prophecy, the life, teachings, death, burial, resurrection and ascension of our atoning sacrifice, the coming of and death of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the church, the announcing of the terms of admission into the church, and the requirements to live faithfully un unto death. All of these things are expressions of God's grace. Mankind did nothing to provide that, cannot earn it, and does not deserve it under any circumstances. If we also think of faith as a comprehensive theological term standing for man's response to God's gracious offer, then faith as a summarizing term contains everything we do to avail ourselves of God's gracious offer of salvation. It involves hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, living a life of loyal commitment and faithfulness unto death. Grace is God reaching down to fallen man through Christ. Faith is man reaching upward to God through a response. As such, our faith must always, must always be active and never passive. James could not have said it any more clearly. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. 
Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. God did his part. We must do ours. God's grace and man's faith working together towards the eternal purpose of the Father. By God's grace, we are saved through faith. Those who live in obedient service to Christ are faithful, meaning they are full of faith. Those who are faithful have that living, perfected, and complete faith which saves, doing all of the things that the Bible says saves us, believing all of the things that the Bible says saves us, having faith, good works, obedience, benevolence. We worship. We come to church. We worship in spirit and in truth. All of these things work together for the faithful life, for a life that is full of faith. The lesson is yours. If there's anybody here this evening that has any need, if they need to be baptized to become a member of the, of the Lord's family, then this is your opportunity to do that. If there's anybody here this evening that is in need of prayers for any reason, now is your opportunity to do that. Please come as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.